Our scripture passage today is from the Gospel according to Luke. This is chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And uh, many of you will recognize this as the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, we are beginning in our summer series today with uh, talking about the parables of Jesus. And we'll be taking the best loved and sometimes most controversial stories that Jesus uh, preached in his ministry and, uh, and be studying them this summer together. And today we're talking about the Good Samaritan. And uh, this is Luke 10, 25 to 37. You can follow along in your bulletin. Um, or in your own Bibles, and uh, after we read this, immediately following, there'll be a brief moment of silent meditation. So Luke 10, 25 to 37, listen now to the word of the Lord. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho And he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed him, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, Take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we read a quite timely parable, didn't we? I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't plan it to be this way at all. When we had decided to do the series on parables, it was a few months ago, and I decided a good place to start a parable series was on the parable that was the most popular, the one of the Good Samaritan. The parable talking about how we can be a neighbor to other people. How we can love our neighbor as ourself. And it is a timely parable because the last two weeks, we've not been very good neighbors to each other. I'm not accusing anyone individually, but as a country and as a whole, we have not been good neighbors. And there's, there's plenty of blame to pass around. There's plenty of fault, plenty of fingers that we can point at people, but there was just lots of us forgetting who our neighbor is. And you can trace most of this trouble back to the day when two men were at their house, saw another man running in their neighborhood. He looked different from them, and they decided, he is not my neighbor. He does not belong here. So they armed themselves with guns and they chased him down and after a confrontation left him dead on the road. The situation peaked about a month or two later when a police officer knelt on a suspect who pled for help. And the police officer forgot that the man beneath him was his neighbor. And he died in police custody. 
And then you all know what happened after. Protests and anger erupted across the country. Peaceful demonstrations turned violent. And the demonstrators forgot who their neighbor was. And they looted the businesses of their neighbor. They destroyed the homes of their neighbor. They burned and robbed those things which belonged to their neighbor. You can be said that as a country we've been suffering from widespread amnesia. We have forgotten who our neighbor is. And we have forgotten how to love our neighbor as we love ourself. Now today, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting a series on the parables of Jesus. And it makes sense to start with a parable that is the most well-known. Probably the most beloved parable that Jesus told. The story of the Good Samaritan. Now this story is popular for a very, very good reason. It's a story Jesus tells of this radical act of kindness towards a stranger. It's a heartwarming story that reminds us all of the brotherhood of humanity. But it's also a scary story. If, if you read it and you consider the implications of the story, it is quite frightening because it is a frightening reminder of the depth of our obligation that we have to one another. And the story begins with a lawyer. It begins with a lawyer who comes to ask Jesus a question. And he says, Lord, what must I do to gain eternal life? Now that, that's an older way of saying, how can I be sure that I'm saved? That's what the lawyer wanted to know. That's what he came to Jesus with his question for. He says, I want to be certain 100% that I am saved. And that is a perfectly good question. It is a great one to ask. Something that I think we all want to know. Now Jesus, he never answers questions straight out. And in this way, he's no different. He, he answers his question with another question. He says, okay, what does the law tell you? You're asking me, what information have you gotten so far to tell you about what you need to do to gain eternal life? He says, how do you read the law? Now the lawyer is a good lawyer. He knows what the law says, and he sums it up right. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answers, you're right. You have answered this question correctly. Do these things. Do this, and you will live. Do this, and you will inherit eternal life. But then the lawyer comes up with a clarification question. He says, okay, okay, I got you. And the love of the Lord your God, I got that. Okay, but what I want to know is this. Who exactly is my neighbor? Now, I said he was a good lawyer. He actually sounds like a really good lawyer. He knew the right questions to ask. And he wanted to know if he was going to be held accountable for loving his neighbor, that he was loving the right person. And he was not going to waste his energy on loving the wrong person at all. I can actually see this guy in heaven probably arguing his case when God asked him, did you love your neighbor as yourself? Okay, let's define neighbor first, okay? And once we define neighbor, then I'll answer if I loved him as I did myself. Scripture says the lawyer asked this question in order to justify himself. That's in order to make sure that he was in the right or to put himself in the right or to justify the things that he had done, in order to do this, he asked the question, okay then, who is my neighbor? So I want to ask you that question. Who is your neighbor? How, how would you answer that? And I'm not talking about how, how you would answer it in church. Of course, when we answer that question in church, or we're talking about asking after we read the Bible, or if Jesus was asking it, we know the end of the story. But assume someone took you by surprise and asked you this question. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? In an easy context, no pressure. No one from your church is watching. to Make sure you get the right answer. How, in just an instinctive way, would we answer the question, who is my neighbor? I think most of us would give probably the most narrow definition of that term, neighbor. Because when I think of neighbor, what I think of is the people that live in my neighborhood. Those are my neighbors, the people who live close to me, the guy next door to me, Mac, he's my next door neighbor. Some of those younger guys who just moved in, I don't know too well, that stay up and party all night. 
They're my other next door neighbor. I can point to you. I know them. I know them by name. I've seen. I know their face. These are my neighbors, the people that live close to me. But if we were to, to broaden that answer out and not include just the people who live close to me, who all is my neighbor? I think the answer that we would come up with, maybe not in word, but in actuality, is the people that we identify with. That is my neighbor. The people that are like me. People that, that think like me, that look like me, that have values like me, that dress like me. These are the ones that I can identify with. That when we have conversations, I don't have to, to justify myself or to say, well, no, 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 all people think this. They just understand how I think and we have this easy going conversation and relationship because they're like me. And this makes perfect, perfect sense. Because the opposite of the neighbor, on the other hand, is the stranger. And the stranger is someone who looks different from us, who acts different from us. Maybe they're on the other side of the town. They live on the, on the wrong side of the tracks or just even the other side of the tracks. They act different. They dress different. They have a, a different way of expressing themselves. They have different ideas about life. They are the others, the foreigners, the strangers. So on one side of our tracks, we've got our neighbor. Those are the people like us, the people that we identify with as our people, as an us, a we. Then on the other side of the tracks, you've got your, your strangers and your foreigners, the people who, who act different, and that's the them. And what our Lord has told us to do is love our neighbor. And our thinking, that turns into, well, I'm going to love people like me, right? I mean, I'm not going to hate the strangers, don't get me wrong. But they're somebody else's neighbor. They're not my neighbor. They're not my responsibility. To me, they're strangers, foreigners, different, other. That's typically who we consider our neighbor to be. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this, all of us. I don't care where you live, how much money you have, what color you are. We all do this. This is just automatic. It is an extremely human thing to identify with the people who look, act, and think like you. And we, and we do this automatic assessment of people to see if they are a neighbor or not by appearance or by mannerisms. And sometimes if they, they look and act enough like us, then we'll figure out in conversation if our, they're a neighbor or not. We talk to them and we kind of feel out their political affiliations or how they feel about certain issues or what team they pull for or what side of the political aisle they're on. And then we determine if they're really our neighbor or a stranger. And we love, we love our neighbors because they're like us. It's easy to love our neighbors. It's just easy to love people like ourselves. So how do we answer that question? Who is my neighbor? That's probably how the lawyer would have answered that in an instinct. That's probably how we would answer that. But the lawyer wanted to be sure. The lawyer wanted to be sure he had his neighbor right, so he asked Jesus to justify himself, who then is my neighbor? And in typical Jesus fashion, he does not come out with an outright answer to who my neighbor is. Instead, he tells the lawyer a story. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, a lot of time has passed between when Jesus told the story and now, and a lot of the significance of the Samaritan is lost on us completely because we don't really know what a Samaritan is. In fact, the only time we hear Samaritan is when we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. So Samaritan is actually a good word to us. We think it's a nice person. A good neighbor, someone that helps strangers. That's who a Samaritan is. But when Jesus told his story, he was speaking to a Jewish audience, and they would have heard Samaritan in a very, very different way. See, a Samaritan, them, was a stranger, it was an other. The Samaritans were once part of the nation of Israel along with the Israelites, and back in the days of David and Solomon, it was one kingdom. But after Solomon's death, the kingdom broke off. There was a rebellion in the north, and they broke off from the kingdom of the south in Jerusalem, and they began to worship God in a different way. While the Israelites worshiped God in Jerusalem, the Samaritans worshiped God on a holy mountain. 
and they were known as a whole different sect of people. They were not like us. They were others. They were strangers. They were foreigners. They had their own ways of living. They had their own ways of dressing, I am sure, and they had their own ways of worshiping God. These were not people like us. And so Jesus tells the story of a man, and we assume it's a Jewish man, walking along a road. He's attacked by robbers. He is stripped, he is beaten, and he is left for dead. Now after he's laying on the road dying, two men walk by. And these two men are very much like him. These are two men that he should be able to identify with and they should be able to identify with him. There is a priest first and then a Levite. And not only people like him, they're leaders in his community, religious leaders who knew the law, who knew their obligation, and they knew better than to walk by someone who was on the side of the road dying. But that's what they did. They walked by and ignored him. And then someone comes down the road that is very much unlike him. This Samaritan, this stranger, this other. And what the Samaritan does is he gets off of his horse, or it says his animal, either donkey or horse. He gets off and he kneels into the ground next to him. And he binds up his wounds. And he cares for him and he puts him on his own animal. And he takes him to an inn. And he gives money to the innkeeper to care for him. And he says, keep caring for him. And when I come back, I will pay whatever money you spend to care for this man. And when Jesus finished the story, he asked the lawyer, he says, okay, you want to know who your neighbor is? I've just told you this story. Now you tell me which one of these people was his neighbor. The lawyer answered, the one who showed him mercy. See, by doing this, Jesus has radically defined who our neighbor is. Our neighbor is not just the people that are like me, not just those that think like us and look like us, not just people that we identify with. Your neighbor can be anybody. Your neighbor can be anyone that you come across, anyone you confront, anyone who enters your sphere of sight or sound or influence. That is who your neighbor is. He can be anyone. He can be everyone. Whoever is near you at the time, that is your neighbor. When your UPS driver comes to deliver a package to your house, you may have never laid eyes on this man before, but as he enters your yard and he enters your sight for that moment, he is your neighbor. When the mail carrier comes to deliver your mail, she is your neighbor. When you walk by a homeless person on the street, he is your neighbor. The cashier who rings you up at the grocery store is your neighbor. The lady in front of you in the line complaining about how long the line is, is your neighbor. The waitress who takes a long time to bring you your food is your neighbor. The janitor cleaning up the halls of your school is your neighbor. The cop who pulls you over in the street is your neighbor. The suspect in the car the cop approaches is his neighbor. The famous theologian G.K. Chesterton said this about our neighbors. We make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our neighbor. And we have to love our neighbor simply because he is there. He is the sample of humanity which is actually given to us precisely because he can be anybody, he is everybody. He is a symbol because he is an accident. It's a very simple but a very powerful idea. And much good I know can come of it. If we looked at everyone that we confront in this world as a neighbor, I believe it would change the way we treat them. See, when you see a neighbor, we tend to give them the benefit of the doubt. It almost doesn't matter what they're doing or how strange it looks to us. We assume that they're doing it for good reason. And we'll reserve judgment until we have more information when we see our neighbor doing it. We see our neighbor running down the street, we assume he's in there for a nice jog. If you see your neighbor walking in front of your house staring at it, we're going to assume he's not casing the place, but he's just admiring the flowers 
that you just planted. It's a great policy to be prepared to see every person that we confront, not as a stranger, but as a neighbor. And I believe much of the turmoil that we find ourselves in the midst of today could be avoided if we treated each other like neighbors instead of like strangers. If every policeman, for every car he approached, every person, suspect he came, uh, came across regardless of their race or how their car looked at, instead of looking at them as a potential criminal or a thug as a troublemaker, think of them as my neighbor. How would it have changed things? And if we as a nation would look at policemen despite their perception of the stories we might hear or the videos posted or what they'll say about them on the news, look at all of them as our neighbors. The man behind the badge, the woman behind the badge is in fact our neighbor and ones that have taken the responsibility of defending law and order in our world. Think how that would have changed things. It's a simple but powerful idea. Who is my neighbor? And you have to admit we have not been acting like neighbors recently. But some people have been acting like neighbors. You're not going to see it on the news. You're not going to see it posted on the cable 24-hour news. And, And by the way, you probably shouldn't watch too much of that anyway. It's really not good for your health. After 30 minutes... You've gotten the idea of all the stories out there. If you watch it any longer, it's only going to make you upset, mad, or depressed. But if you look past that, and if you really see, there are examples of people today being neighbors. Examples of people today being modern day good Samaritans. There's a story you may have heard of Chris Swanson. He's a sheriff in Flint, Michigan who in confronting the protesters, put his baton down. He took his helmet off and walked across and said, what can I do for you? And they said, brother, we want you to march with us. And so a sheriff of Flint, Michigan, joined arms with the protesters and marched for a while, but he wasn't marching then with protesters. He was marching with his neighbors. There's a story of the Portland Police Department who in a show of solidarity over the grief of the death of George Floyd, knelt with protesters. Because they remembered, these are not strangers, these are our neighbors. And there's the story of the citizens in Philadelphia who went down to a store and blocked it to protect it from being looted because they remembered, this belongs to my neighbor. And there's a story of the policeman in Louisville who during some riots was separated from his unit and found himself quickly surrounded by a group of protesters but they they weren't surrounding him to attack him they had their backs to him to defend him from others because they remembered this is not a policeman this is my neighbor and my personal favorite is a story of a man named Marvin Applewhite he's not shown up on the news you probably have never heard of him It's a hard figure to find out about. It's a hard story to dig up, but it makes a powerful statement. For Marvin, the day after the riots in Minneapolis was found on the streets the next day, picking up trash. He had his broom in his bag, and he was going to pick up after the riots. It's unsung work, but it's work like that, it's hearts like that, that truly keep our world together. Men and women willing to go out to pick up rather than destroy. For Marvin was a man who remembered this is not somebody else's street. This belongs to my neighbor. So Jesus tells a story about a priest who walked by a man who was hurt. About a Levite who walked by a man who was hurt. And then a Samaritan who got on the ground to pick up a fallen man. And he asked a question, which one is my neighbor? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus replied, go and do likewise. So I ask you today, 
of these people. A policeman who will not listen to cries for mercy. Politicians trading blame for a crisis. Rioters throwing bricks and looting stores in the name of justice. Or the police who walks with protesters. Protesters who defend a fallen policeman and the citizen who goes to clean up after a riot. Which one of these is a neighbor? Now go and do likewise. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Father, we come to you today as your people to lift up prayers, Lord, for our help, for our healing, and for our salvation. Lord, I pray today that you teach us, Lord, how to be neighbors. Father, I pray that you give us eyes that so all the people we meet, everyone, Lord, we see them not as strangers, but as neighbors. And Father, I pray that in our hearts of hearts, you give us, Lord, the affection to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Father, may we remember that we are all part of your family, the family of saints, all your children made by your hand. And it is your command, Lord, that we love one another. Lord, I pray that you send us out into the world to be good neighbors. Father, you send us out into the world to bind up the brokenhearted, to lift up the oppressed, to feed the hungry, to heal the wounded, to guide those that are lost back home again. Father, we pray for our neighbors in turmoil. We pray a peace upon our cities and a peace upon our communities. Lord, we pray a healing and a rebuilding upon all those communities and all those cities that have been destroyed by the riots. Father, we pray a rebuilding and a peace upon our nation, separated and divided. Lord, we lift up prayers for those in this church and in this community. We lift up all those who need your healing hand, Lord. We lift up Judy Ball. We lift up Brenda. We lift up Judy Price and Barbara. And pray your healing be upon them in body and soul and spirit. Father, we pray for all those that grieve today. Especially, Lord, we lift up Carson and Grayson and the entire Carter family. And pray, Father, your healing and your peace and your comfort be in their hearts. Lord, we lift up all the unspoken prayers that are on the hearts of your people today. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that you hear the cries of their hearts and you attend to us in ways that only your spirit can. Lord, I pray that you would protect us and guard us, to keep us in body and soul and spirit. I pray, Lord, that you guard us from the attacks of the evil one and guard us even from the darkness of our own hearts. Lord, we pray that you lead us by the light and lead us to the light. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.